Okay, here we are for our very last lecture in the Crusades, History 4332. And uh, what I want to do tonight is um, do a kind of overview. And what I did was to model uh, this lecture on the very first lecture I gave, uh, which is actually listed as, I believe, no, I don't think I actually put the notes for that on the website. And uh, it's really an overview of the entire course and a review of the entire course. But after we get through reviewing all of the specific information that we got in each of the lectures on each of the topics, then I have some overall interpretive questions that will help you with your final exam and to think about the issues for the final exam. So that's kind of what I thought I would do tonight. And I also brought uh, the books that we've used in this course that I'll mention at the appropriate time uh, that we're going to do them. So let's look at our notes. Um, lecture 21, Review, Reconsiderations, and Conclusions. And I may not give you all of the conclusions that are in my mind. I might give you some alternative suggestions for ways to interpret this course and ways to look at this issue, uh, the different issues. So first, what I want to do is to return to some of the questions with which we began and look at all the topics we've covered. And as I go through a, a sort of mini review of each of the topics, um, in, the, in the form of questions, and I'll answer some of those, those questions, uh, try to look for patterns and, and some kind of pattern to the whole thing, some kind of way to interpret everything. Okay. Um, okay, I don't need that. The calling of the First Crusade. Okay. Uh, we have the calling of the First Crusade, and, and so naturally, a course on the Crusade, you would think, would start with the calling on the of the First Crusade. Um, and, uh, but really, we went back in time. We had to look at some of the causes, and then we had to consider whether there were long-range causes or short-range causes, and which were the most important, and, and how do you come up with causes of a particular event, like suddenly the idea to call a crusade. It did, didn't just pop out of nowhere. It didn't come from, from you know, an, an idea that suddenly people had. Uh, and what led to the pilgrimages of armed knights. And remember that throughout the entire period of the Crusades, they never came up with a word for Crusades. That's actually a 19th century label that were, or 16th century label that was tacked onto it. And so they had no word for what we call the Crusades. They might have thought of them as pilgrimages or holy wars, and they thought of them differently in different centuries because really, when we look at the First Crusade starting in 1095, it runs, uh, the Crusades then run all the way through to 1500 or 1700, depending on which expert you, you listen to. Uh, uh, so we've got at least um, 400 years, maybe more, that the Crusades took place. So they were looked at differently at different times. In order to look for causes, we had to go back and see what Europe was like when the Crusades began. And what had been happening before 1095 that actually led up to the calling of the Crusade in 1095, and also why Europeans responded so enthusiastically. Rarely does an idea pop up out of nowhere. And, and what people tend to say is it's in the air. Somehow that, that idea sparked something, sparked a chord that everybody could respond to. Something had been going on that made them want to go on crusade. So we kind of looked, we looked at the society, a military society, um, where we have uh, a system of feudalism, knights in shining armor and feudalism, um, uh, uh, reciprocal obligations between lords and vassals in a military society. And, and feudalism, of course, started with military obligations. Uh, probably the most um, evident military society was the Normans, and here we see the bio-tapestry and scenes from the uh, Norman conquest of England, which, which some historians view as the quintessential feudal society with the Normans. Uh, along with the military society came the uh, building of castles, and castles were the major um, uh, 
building or, or institution, the fortification that um, also shaped the future of Europe. The, the fact that the castle would be an, administra an administrative center, a trading center, a center of focus for a very primitive kind of government that was that was being um, carried on in the feudal society. And here we see the Battle of Hastings in 1066 with these Norman knights. And here's a close-up of uh, the Norman knights. It actually says the Frankie fight, but uh, they're actually Normans. Uh, they call themselves the Franks. And it's a military society, so they fight battles constantly. Uh, it's also a Christian society, and here we have a bishop, uh, the, the seal of William, Arch Archbishop of Rems, and um, it's a Christian society and a society where Christianity is being overwhelmed by feudalism because in the century before 1095, feudalism had just begun to grow and it was taking over all the functions of society, including those functions of the church. So that often we found that um, the vassals might be an abbot who might be a military vassal, or a bishop might be a military vassal of the local lord or the local count or duke. And that lord, whether he was a count or a duke or later a king, would expect military obligations from those um, from those, those um, um, Christian uh, 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 sort of uh, monastic or Episcopal uh, people as their, as their fiefs were. And so, the, um, and so being overwhelmed by the feudal society, uh, we might expect the church to object, and it did. And this is called a reform movement that actually arose to try to win the liberty of the church from the domination of lay lords or secular lords. And so this movement was going on as well before the First Crusade began, before the call to the Crusade began. And another thing we saw that uh, was that the church, as it built itself into a reform institution, modeled itself curiously after lay society. We have the feudal society where you have a a baron, or a, you could have a count, or a duke, or, or a baron, or a king, who then would have his major vassals around him in a kind of council. And the council would be bound <clears throat> by the feudal obligation to um, advise the Lord. And institutions like that are mirrored in the papal court and in the church courts, where each of the churchmen thought of himself also as a kind of lord over time with a council around him to advise him. And here is the ultimate council, the, the pope holding a council with all of his bishops and archbishops and monks around him to advise him in, in the feudal manner. We also have a time when religious ideas were changing, and not just religious ideas, but whole sets of concepts within that society. Um, a, a new vision of what the world was like uh, with a new confidence and optimism, and we can see that through some visual symbols of change. And um, I'm going to ask um, those of you who are here for uh, maybe some input on this. Uh, here we have a crucifix, and uh, what does this suggest to you? What kind of image do we see here? Yeah. Well, we've talked throughout the class how the art changed from, uh, it's to show more the humanity of, of Christ. And they put yes. him back on the cross. Uh -huh. They put him back on the cross in a way, <laughs> that's one way to put it, yeah. They, they represent him on the cross, whereas they had, hadn't done that mostly in the centuries before the 12th century or the 11th century. They hadn't represented him very much on the cross because they were ashamed of him dying on the cross, and it was like death was conquering. But now they have a new concept behind that idea of Christ dying on the cross, that it expresses his humanness, 
and the fact that he took on human form and that he was half human and half divine or, or totally human and totally divine as, they, as the church later interpreted it. And so we have a new image of Christ with his humanity stressed rather than his authority and his judging role as we had had in the past. Again, uh, stressing um, hu uh, humaneness uh, more or less. We also have a new vision of the Virgin Mary up to the 11th century, the Virgin was maybe not represented a, a, an enormous amount, um, uh, but she was, she was assuming a really new role in the 11th and 12th century. She was assuming the role as a kind of co-ruler with Christ, Christ, as the Queen of Heaven and as the ultimate mother. And the concept behind that was, of course, you know, who does a son listen to more than anybody in the world? And that is his mother, of course. So Mary takes on this role uh, uh, with some feminine twist to it. I mean, she almost replaces Christ as the judge. But now she's not a punishing judge like uh, the old-fashioned way that Christ was looked at as, as a, a punishing, uh, judgmental judge. But she is a judge of mercy. And so people go to her court for the mercy that Mary um, offers. We also have here, here is another picture of her as a loving and tender mother. And so this also elevates the concept of women. And I think you'll see that women play, or we have seen that women play a very major role in society. And, and uh, the status of women is, is greatly enhanced by the rise of the cult of the Virgin, which, by the way, appears everywhere. It is like the crucifixes. It's endlessly multiplied in all the churches throughout Europe. And the third concept that changes is the concept of the devil. And now, instead of being seen as a realistic figure, he's seen as a joke. And so he's powerless. He's really seen as, as someone who is powerless and not even real, you know, more like a, a fantasy. And so it, it's as if the devil has been overcome, that the goodness of God and the fact that, that man is made in God's image and that man is godlike uh, tends to overthrow the devil as a force, and he's, he's a joke now. And this is a wonderful picture of Christ and his mother as, um, as co-rulers, as partners in the rule. This is ninth century, which is interesting um, that uh, that movement is starting as early as the ninth century before Christ is shown on the crucifix, but they are shown as co-rulers and equals which is an interesting thing. We have another revolution going on. That, that is a revolution of, of a kind of worldview of the way people look at the world. Now they look at the world as a, a, not a threatening place, but as a welcoming place, a place where they can function and where they can succeed. And in fact, they look at the world in that way as uh, favored by God and given to mankind by God because things are going really well. Uh, by 1095, the Viking invasions have ended, the Saracen invasion, invasions have ended, and the, um, all the invasions uh, uh, coming from all different directions have ended in Europe. We have a period of peace, and we have a, a, an agricultural revolution with the introduction of the heavy plow that you can see here. Uh, and this is before uh, the conquest of England, and a consequent revolution in farming, in agriculture, so that now we have the three field system, and here you can see the three fields um, uh, that are endlessly rotated, the crops are rotated, uh, spring, fall, and fallow, and uh, the building of the manor house as an economic unit that is much more productive. And so we have more productive farming, we have increases in the amount of food that's grown and nutritional gains that are made. We also have the beginnings of a technological revolution. And, and, and of course, uh, that heavy plow is a machine with moving parts, but the major machine that powered what is called the Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages was the water mill. And here is a water mill that can perform all kinds of work, uh, from grinding grain to processing cloth to pumping out mines or, or um, processing leather. Um, it is the steam engine of its day. And in the places where 
you couldn't build a water mill if you didn't have a stream or a tide or, or some place to put your water mill. Um, you could handily put up this windmill that uh, people invented in order to um, take advantage of the other uh, power of nature, which is the wind. And so you could knock up a little mill like this in a couple of hours and behold, you have a power source free. And um, actually we're returning to wind power in this country in the face of, of um, power crises and, and um, conserving the environment. Um, there are now wind farms in this country using this medieval invention. And with the growth of all this free power and with the growth of uh, population, of course, when you have better nutrition and more crops, you have population growth. And in fact, in the period between 1000 and about 1300, uh, uh, the population of Europe quadrupled. And the people, of course, you know, this quadruple population had to go somewhere and it went into cities and so cities were were rising at a very high rate all over Europe and with the rising of cities there was a building boom this is a beautiful church actually in Sweden uh, which is built in the Romanesque style from the continent uh, that was adopted in Sweden and built in this uh, in the 12th century uh, a Romanesque church and so we have a building boom all over Europe and the trade routes are burgeoning because the surpluses that are being produced now allow trade. Trade also means communication and uh, the growth of cities means new social classes like a merchant class, like a, the town laborers are now growing and so the old three class system, those who work, those who fight and those who pray is being uh, added to with a fourth class uh, which ranges from rich international merchants to the artisans who bake bread and have businesses in the, in the town, small business people. But we can see the proliferation of trade in the North Sea, in the Mediterranean, and the land routes here. And so we have all of these revolutions going on in Europe. These are all happening in the 11th century. That's when it is going on. Yet another one of these uh, uh, revolutions that's going on is the building of national states, or we can say proto-states, uh, kingdoms. We have to think of them as units of government like kingdoms, but it's an administrative and bureaucratic organization that hadn't existed for several hundred years. And so this is going, uh, kingdoms are coalescing at this time. And here is the Anglo-Norman state, England and Normandy. Uh, France uh, coalesces in a much, to a much lesser degree. The Holy Roman Empire, if we want to call it that, was coalescing. It, it, it had a history of, of coming together temporarily and then sort of breaking down. <laughs> and, and so, but France and England are the main ones that, that power uh, the, um, the, the incredible growth that's happening in the 11th and 12th century. Uh, here is uh, Louis the Gross, Louis, Louis the Fat, uh, who was uh, the first king of France who really pulled things together. He started to pull things together at about the time the Anglo-Norman state was coming together. And the church also, following the pattern of lay society, the church was coming together too with Gregory the Seventh and the reform movement and building a a church government that mirrored the government of the of the states um, that was building its bureaucracy and centralizing at this time. Gregory the Seventh also was a key figure in forming the ideas of the crusade. As you recall, he was the one who visualized the Miles Christi, the, the soldier of Christ. And he thought of having a crusade before Urban ever called it. He want, what he wanted to do was sanctify the warrior and bring him in to be part of a society that was a warrior society. He Christianized the warrior in the warrior society. And he also saw himself anew as Peter's represent representative on earth and the head of an international government with um, uh, uh, St. Peter's representative himself, uh, in the case of Gregory, on the throne. And so here is the Miles Christe, the idea that he came up with, uh, the um, soldier for Christ. And this is an actual crusader knight. How can we tell he's a crusader? 
because he's loaded with crosses. Yeah, he's got crosses all over himself. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, when the first crusade was called, uh, you know, clerics who called it would tear up their robes and, and give them to people. And you wonder how they stuck them on their clothes. <laughs> They must have had their servants there to sew them on, but he's got a banner and he's got a, and he's got crosses all over him, and um, uh, what he's doing with his hands like that is he is he is swearing homage to God, and so God is now his feudal lord, and he is swearing his life to God. So here we have the crusade. Well, who were their enemies? Who were the enemies of these crusaders? Uh, at first, uh, they envisioned themselves as going against um, the Muslims who were in control of the Holy Land. And so the first enemy envisioned, there, there, were some, there were some sort of precursor events to the Crusades, some conquests with the Papal Banner, uh, the conquest of England, the conquest of, of Normandy, uh, some skirmishes in Spain. There were kind of little precursors, but the calling of the big crusade was against Islam and the Muslims who held the Holy Land. Well, who were they? Who were these enemies? How did they come to occupy the Holy Land? What were their beliefs and customs? And how did the Islamic world differ from the, from the European world? And we might also ask, why did the Europeans perceive the Muslims as the enemy? And did they perceive them as the enemy at first? Um, uh, any, any ideas on that right, before we sort of look at those? <laughs> I think they, per yeah, Travis. Yeah. I don't know if they really perceived them as enemy, uh, more so it's just being uh, usurpers. They, they took the space that belonged to them, so it's, they're, they're not, you know. Uh, Personified as enemies. Right, yeah, yeah. It, it's not a, a typical uh, arch enemy type racial hatred. Yeah. It's more just get out of my land, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. I mean, and that's, that goes for the Muslims in Spain as well as the Muslims in the Holy Land. They thought of them as people who had usurped their power and their land in the holy places, especially in the Holy Land. In Spain, it was, I, I don't think they had that fervor. I, I think that the crusade in the Holy Land fed the fervor in Spain to reconquer. As time went on, they began to perceive of the, of the Muslims as enemies and infidels. But when they first started out, I don't think they, they saw them that way, do you? What do you think? No, I think that they became enemies because mm -hmm. of the continual conflict. Yeah. Uh, the, the hundreds of years of fighting made them enemies. Yeah, I think I think that's really true. And, and they didn't start out because, and there's some actual evidence for that. Um, uh, one is an 11th century book written by Eadmer of Canterbury uh, about uh, the Muslim forces of Roger of Sicily. And Roger, of course, was the king of Sicily. Um, well, he wasn't king, he was Roger the Great Count who had conquered Sicily from the Muslims. And Roger's government was very tolerant, in fact. And um, he brought his Muslim mercenaries into Italy uh, to pacify that country which he inherited and, and maintain his power. And uh, strangely, uh, Eadmer, who hated Jews and, and wrote very um, uh, bad things about the Jews, seemed to tolerate these Muslims. And, and I don't know why. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, um, he, he is honor, he honors them and respects them in, in his story about the, uh, um, the troops, the Muslim troops. And of course, St. Anselm is his big hero. And he talks about Anselm coming in. And the Muslim troops recognized the sanctity of Anselm and sort of bowed to him. And, 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 uh, and he, he shows them in a very positive light. And this, of course, is before. The First Crusade. <laughs> so it changes, it changes, and later they're perceived as enemies. Well, what are these people like? And we saw some, some ways in which they were like. They, here's a caravan, they're a desert people. Uh, the, the core society is, is Arabic, and so everything in Islam is based on Arabic society. Here are Arabian camels and camel drivers. 
and uh, they're a merchant society. Mecca is the holy city, uh, and here is the Kaaba in Mecca with the wall around it and the city of Mecca. They're merchant, middle-class merchant kinds of people, and they're very into trade, and it's very much a commercial society. Um, Arabic is the language. Of course, the Koran is the holy book, and you're not allowed to translate it. Every letter is sacred in the Koran, and so, and so you're not allowed to translate it. And in fact, making uh, uh, graven images uh, of human beings and animals is actually forbidden in Islam. And so, most of the art and decoration is letters from the Koran, passages from the Koran, such as this, which is a passage. And the concept of paradise, which actually makes you think of a garden, uh, uh, an oasis in the desert with uh, fountains and with flowing streams and with date palms. And, and this is where the idea of the Persian rugs gets going as an idea of paradise, which is shown as a garden, and usually with a fountain in, in the middle of it, or the four rivers of paradise. But this is an example of a garden that, it, that represents paradise. And uh, Islam spread over the whole world. It started out as a militaristic society uh, itself. And so it, it started out as a merchant society which became militaristic because uh, Muhammad had to flee to uh, Medina and then when he returned to Mecca he conquered it and then marshaled the Bedouin forces of Arabia into a huge army which conquered all of Arabia and then spread out to the west and spread out to the east in a very short period. Uh, in about 50 years, they were halfway across here, and by the end of 100 years, they had all of this territory. So they spread out very quickly, um, not necessarily because they were great, such great soldiers, but because um, the Byzantine and Persian empires were exhausted from fighting each other. And so, and so there was a kind of vacuum that Islam poured into. And of course, the, the West was very weak. The Roman Empire had fallen. There was no power to hold it. And so Islam flowed into that vacuum. Uh, Jerusalem was one of the places that it flowed into. And Jerusalem became a holy city of Islam, too, because Muhammad is said to have gone to heaven from uh, Jerusalem. So it became a city holy to Islam. Uh, later on, uh, the capital shifted to Damascus in the area of Syria, and here's a picture of Damascus. And later still, when Persia became more prominent in this, uh, in, in this new religion, the capital shift to Baghdad, farther east in the Mesopotamian River Valley. And we have a, an explosion of high culture blending together all the cultures that Islam unified. Uh, here's the Alhambra with Moorish ornament on it. Here is uh, a mosque in Cairo, again, with, with these typical Muslim uh, uh, architectural uh, blends of Persian and Greek and Roman sources. And here is a really beautiful interior of a mosque. Um, blending all of these elements together. It became a very high culture. Here's the court of the Alhambra in Granada. Again, a very beautiful culture. And science went along with technology uh, um, in, um, uh, in the, the science of, uh, um, I'm starting to say, Astronomy. <laughs> I started to say astrology. No, that's not right. It's astronomy. And in algebra and in mathematics, uh, uh, they developed uh, the science of essentially the Mesopotamian River Valley and the Persians and the Greeks and the Indians that all merged together. But then, by the time the Crusades started, uh, their political unity was gone and they had broken up into smaller uh, political units and so that here are all these different separate political units uh, but there were new invaders the great Seljuk Empire created by the Seljuk Turks who move into this area and this breaking up of the of the unity of Islam was also one of the things that caused the First Crusade because the Byzantines, you know, called on, on Europe to rescue uh, them from the attacks of the Seljuks. And Seljuks, being Turks rather than Arabs and being new converts, were more fervent and they're both conquerors and religiously. 
Well, how uh, the, the First Crusade was then called from 1095 to 1099. Uh, how did the Crusaders organize, or did they? And you can already call, well, some of them did and some of them didn't, but it was very slapdash, wasn't it? It was very much spur of the moment, and they didn't know what they were doing, and they kind of, you know, they were winging it. They were figuring things out as they went along. Uh, how did they get to the Holy Land? Well, wave after wave went in small groups and large groups, and, and, and of course the original crusaders following Peter the Hermit were all slaughtered, and they didn't know what they were doing, and they didn't know where they were going. They were just stepping out into the brink of nowhere and paying the consequences. Uh, what did they find when they got to the Holy Land? Well, they found a very different society, a merchant society, lots of cities like they, like you know they were growing in Europe, but nothing like what you had in, in the East. And they found people who fought differently than they did, just uh, using a lot of different tactics that they weren't used to. And uh, war was very ritualized in Europe, and uh, the different battle tactics uh, stunned them, and they were, they were sort of traumatized by the unexpectedness and the slaughter of the battles. Uh, the Muslims were really shocked to have these invaders come. And the Crusaders, somehow, they conquered the Crusader states. Uh, it's still hard to figure out how they did it. Just dumb luck in a lot of ways. Um, stick to itiveness, although a lot of them deserted. And, and it's kind of remarkable that they actually conquered the Holy Land. And it's just because they were so unexpected and the Muslims didn't organize effectively against them. It was a fluke that they conquered. And of course, in Europe, everybody rejoiced because they couldn't believe it was true. And it really was. Here is preaching the crusade. This is um, um, urban preaching the crusade and of course the crowd shouted out God wills it and here is urban and the route he took the circuitous route all over Europe all over Europe mostly in France preaching the crusade and of course Peter the hermit who was a rabble rouser and got all of the peasants and the and the common people inflamed. Urban didn't want any common people. He wanted knights like these, the gatherings of, of the crusaders who were knight, knighted and armed and prepared and they had money to pay their way. And the four leaders of the first crusade, Godfrey, Raymond, Bohemond, and, and Tancred, who were the great heroes of the whole crusade. Of course, with their this is a 19th century drawing, of course. On the way, of course, they massacred the Jews, and uh, we read um, some very sad things about what happened to the Jews. Here are their roots, as some of them went across Hungary and along the coast here. Some of them went through Italy, and of course, through Asia Minor, and down the coast as they conquered the Holy Land, fighting battles with new enemies that they had never fought with before. And along the way, weapons were developed in the Holy Land that had never been seen in Europe before. Uh, these, these weapons were actually in Europe in a more primitive state, but the weapons of war were finely tuned and well developed in these Crusader battles. And of course, when they got there, they found Jerusalem, they conquered Jerusalem, and the streets ran red with blood. By the time they got to Jerusalem after the, the really it was four years they were there, they were so traumatized that they slaughtered everything that moved in the city. And uh, this was the beginning of the hatred, I think, of the Muslims for the Christians, because the Muslims had always been tolerant toward people of the book, and the Middle East was filled with other Christians of various sects that had, and they had lived in peace with Islam. Uh, and the Crusaders, I think, um, that legacy is still with us today, uh, the slaughter uh, that, that, that um, sort of, polarized the Christians and the Muslims against each other. Well, how did they set up the Crusader states? Uh, we had five, uh, four Crusader states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the County of Edessa, the County of Tripoli, the Principality of Antioch. Those are the main ones, but lots of other little feudal states, and they were governed in a feudal manner. The feudalism in its primitive form from Europe was imported into the Holy Land. 
but they came in very small numbers. Uh, there were colonizers who came and followed the Crusaders to the Holy Land, uh, but mostly they had to control the natives who were already there, ab about five different kinds of Christians who were not unified at all, and none of them Roman Catholics, and so they had to reconcile all those different things of Christianity. And lots of Muslims who who felt like this was an alien government over them. They came in, they had to accept part of the Orthodox Church, but they tried to set up a Roman Catholic organization over the whole area. And in fact, they set up a hierarchy and an aristocracy of Roman Catholics and Franks in the Holy Land, and everyone else was a lesser citizen of lesser rights in that area. Uh, how long did they last? Well, I, I guess it depends on how you count. Uh, <laughs> when was the fall of Jerusalem? You remember? 1187. 1187, 1188. I was just sort of thinking 1188 in my mind. But um, yeah, so how many years is that between uh, uh, 1099 and 1188? 90. 90 years. Okay, that's the fall of Jerusalem. And then they sort of hung on in little enclaves until 1291 when they were all thrown out. But then you have roads that's still there that you can, Cyprus, and you can think of them as crusader states who lasted a lot longer. So it's kind of the way, different ways you look at it. Here are the crusader states, and here is Cyprus, who later uh, was taken over from the Byzantines and became a, cr a crusader kingdom. And um, uh, do, is this Rhodes here? I think this is Rhodes. Okay, I don't have it marked on this map, but here are our kingdoms. Here is the patriarch of Jerusalem, who's set up as the head of the church in, that, in, in uh, the crusader states. And the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, of course, uh, they rebuilt and became a center. This is where all the kings were crowned. And then we have the story of the kings and queens of Jerusalem. And um, what would you say were the major characteristics of the kings and queens of Jerusalem? Well, the first ruler was really not designated a king. He was more of an advocatus. Yeah. Um, one distinctive feature was the prominent role that, dis that the women played in the descent patterns of the, the kings, which was different than in Europe. Yeah, and, and the family. I mean, you didn't have a, a kind of hereditary kingship emerging the same way in the Holy Land that you did in Europe, where a strong kingship grew in Europe. This is not a strong kingship. It is a weak kingship where uh, power is secured largely through marriages. And so it becomes a family inheritance. And, and, and as soon as you have families intermarrying, and as long, when they proliferate, then you're, you're sure to have rivalries to, to the power and to the title of king. And that's exactly what happens here. And it ends up, you know, sort of disintegrating in family feuds uh, for who was going to be king or queen. And here is one of the one of the kings who who became king by uh, his marriage, Guy de Lusignan, and we saw him uh, frequently in the, the territory. Also, they built castles all over the entire uh, area of the Holy Land. Just many, many castles, and they are largely uh, uh, the. Templars and the, the uh, Hospitallers who built these, the uh, Crusading Orders built the castles. Uh, but this is how they controlled the Holy Land. And we also saw the building of a typical feudal government. Here is, here is uh, um, a lord with all of his vassals around him at his court where the major barons uh, um, express their will and their, and their judgment in this court. Um, and the, the ladies also had their courts because we have many queens like Melisande and Alice and Marie who then become very powerful in this government, as Joni said. Well, why were there more crusades after the first crusade? I mean, when people in the first crusade was thought, everybody thought that would be it. They would, I mean, they didn't even have a name for it. They were going to take a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and recapture it. And they did recapture it. And so that should have been the end of it. But why were there more crusades? Any guesses? Because 
Well, there were certain events in the Holy Land that pre precipitated Crusades. The the fall of Jerusalem was one. Yeah. Uh, I think the Battle of Hattin was another. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first event was the fall of Edessa. And Edessa fell in, in uh, 1144, and this is when the Second Crusade was a reaction against that. They thought the Muslims were on the march, the Muslims were repelling them, and so they had to call the Second Crusade. Oh, how many were there? How many crusades were there? <laughs> well, they were innumerable. <laughs> they just went on and on and on, as we said, for several hundred years. So the main ones are numbered. Um, and, and so that's why people like Jonathan Riley Smith have started calling it a crusade, a crusading movement. That he sees it as a movement that permeated all society and ultimately changed Europe drastically, but he saw Europe as being united in this crusading endeavor. And, and I don't say it in quite that way. I mean, I, I think that the idea, the concept of crusade, you know, invigorated Europe and excited them to go on crusade. But then you've got this sort of interactive process where they succeed at the first crusade, they go back to Europe, this, they bring goods, they bring ideas, they bring objects, they bring art, they bring um, clothing, styles, they bring all kinds of things into Europe. And then that generates more people going into the Holy Land, thinking of it, they call it Outremer, the land across the sea. And, and there's an interactive movement that sort of feeds, uh, feeds each, each feeds the other and makes it grow. Uh, was there a crusading movement? Uh, that, I think that's a little bit hard to define, but it's really hard to put a label on what the Crusades were. I mean, I, I find it hard to describe exactly what they were, and so movement, a movement, is one way to describe it. Jonathan Riley Smith says it had a birth, a childhood, an infancy, a childhood, a, a height, a maturity. Uh, he describes it as a kind of organism. Uh, uh, a movement is a movement, a biological entity that can have those stages of life. Well, that's an interesting um, vision that he presents. Uh, the, I, I don't know that you can describe it in quite that way, but, but he tries to do it. And he sees Innocent III as uh, the height of that movement. Uh, the Crusader's state of mind was complex. They weren't simple-minded. They weren't backward. They were. They had multiple, um, uh, multiple motivations as they went to the Holy Land. Some of them truly wanted to save their souls. Others wanted to uh, get rich. Others wanted to build a whole legacy for their family uh, there. And the Crusades obviously changed as time passed. They learned. As they did successive crusades, they learned how to do it better, and so it got to be almost a, a, a hereditary pattern that they started following by the end. Uh, when did people realize that they were crusades? I mean, they realized it without even putting a label on it. Do you, I mean, uh, what do you think, Travis? I think that with Pope Innocent III and the Albigensian Crusade, I think it was pretty well established because when he started using the terms of military service required by the feudal relationship, yes. I think that was really uh, solidified it as an institution. Yeah, but one could also uh, uh, say, and I, some authors have argued that the Third Crusade solidified these and then Innocent uh, institutionalized them in a way, but it's a process that they're going through. But Either one, I mean, either one you could identify as a time when the crusade just solidifies and it becomes a tradition where they already have, they have a pattern that they can follow. And of course, Innocent elaborates that pattern to apply to lots of other areas of society that they hadn't applied to before. And so this is kind of a, maybe that's where, where uh, Jonathan Riley Smith gets that idea of movement. Uh, in, in moving it to different segments of society. Joni, did you have a comment? Well, an innocent not only moves it to different geographical areas, but also against different people. It's no longer just restricted to against the Muslims, like Travis said, the Albigensians, and, and you already had uh, crusades 
going in the north against the pagan winds and, and Finns and, and people. So the whole thing with Innocent really gets expanded, I think, in a number of different ways. But, but then if you go back to the second crusade that St. Bernard called, uh, remember that uh, some people in Germany asked permission to go against the uh, the winds rather than the the Muslims in the Holy Land. So, so there there was there were sort of foreshadowings of of that diversification as early as the Second Crusade. Yeah, did you have a comment on that? Yeah. Well, even you could see that in the First Crusade with the attack on the Jews. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you could see how people were taking this idea and running with it. I mean, attack anyone who's not Christian. <laughs> so it, the idea grows and grows, it kind of snowballs. Uh, Did you have and, and that? then of course during the Fourth Crusade, attack Christians. <laughs> right, attack Christians. So um, uh, yeah, well, maybe it's a movement. It's growing. <laughs> maybe it's an, it's an organism because it, uh, it, it grows, it has growth, yeah. It has a momentum of its own. It's mm -hmm. not in the control of the popes. All they have the power to do is just initiate it, and then it gets carried away on the winds of whatever. And, and the amazing thing is society is so receptive to it. I mean, people just jump on the bandwagon and they're ready to go, and that's a really interesting thing. You know when we're gonna see that again? when we have the exploration of the whole world, when we have Europe breaking out of its boundaries and uh, across the Atlantic and into Asia and Africa, it's, it's an explosion. And, and the Crusades are like that. It's like the Crusades are kind of a precursor to that in, in a way. I think you can see them uh, that way. Well, why do you think all the Crusades to the Holy Land failed except the first one? Well, the first one took the Muslims by surprise. <laughs> yeah, um, they, that's true. After that, it's, uh, they had a chance to uh, organize better, and they, they had Saladin. He was a, a really good uh, military leader. Yeah, I, I think the Crusaders, when they first went into the Holy Land, they were kind of filling a vacuum, don't you think? I mean, there was kind of a power vacuum there. Yeah, Travis, did you have an idea? Yeah, I was going to say that it, I don't think it's really fair to say that they all failed. Um, it depends on what, what you prescribe as their motive, because I would say that the Third Crusade with uh, Richard Lionheart, I, I think that was extremely successful. It, um, it solidified the Western uh, seaboard, and uh, their position was real solid after the Third Crusade. Yeah, I think that's a valid argument, so that maybe we can't say they all failed. I mean, uh, uh, it depends on what your ultimate goal was. If we want Richard Lionheart to reconquer the entire Holy Land, he didn't do that. But he certainly strengthened it. He certainly was able to, uh, to recover a lot of land that was lost to Saladin. And, and we could argue that he was equal to Saladin in, in many ways as far as, as his victory there. So that's, that's really true. And, and what about Richard Lionheart uh, actually conquering Cyprus and founding that crusader state? One could argue that that was a big success and it lasted longer than the others. Yeah. But wasn't that from the uh, Byzantines? That yeah. wasn't Muslim. <laughs> wasn't Muslim, it was Byzantine. But by then they were regarding the, the Byzantines as their enemy as well. Anybody who was non-Christian became an enemy. And so Christianity actually had been um, fairly tolerant of other religions until the Crusades started. And whether the tolerance came before or after the Crusades is an interesting question to ask, the intolerance. When did the intolerance start of Christianity toward other religions? Um, I might go back to the Vikings and think about that as the time when a major pagan religion really impinges on Europe in the invasions of the Vikings, the Magyars, and the Saracens, um, where Europe was under the gun from all of these other religions that weren't Christian. Uh, and so that's something to think about is where it came from. Well, who called the Second Crusade? We already said St. Bernard and the Knights Templar and Hospitaller really got going during the Second Crusade. Uh, its leaders, who were the leaders of the Second Crusade? Do you remember? Second Crusade. 
<laughs> they're not in the notes. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember either. I, they're not very important. I think it's Louis the Seventh. Louis, oh, you're right. Yeah, Louis the Seventh and Ellen. Eleanor of yeah, Aquitaine. Took Eleanor and with took him. Eleanor of Aquitaine. And Conrad the Third of Germany. Yeah. Yeah, Conrad the Third of Germany and uh, Louis the Seventh and Eleanor of Aquitaine. I always like to remember Eleanor as this is her crusade, but it was an utter failure. I mean, it was just they had a glorious time marching to the Holy Land, but they certainly didn't reconquer anything. And the fall of Edessa initiated it. Of course, we already said that. Here's Bernard preaching the Second Crusade. If we say what is important about the Second Crusade, I think it's St. Bernard's preaching more than anything. He solidified the way of calling crusades, of preaching the crusades. Yeah. Wasn't it Bernard who also associated the uh, failure of the crusades? The, the crusades were blessed by God, therefore if it succeeded it was God, and if it failed it was the uh, Europeans' fault. Yes, yes, he did that. But he also, uh, uh, his letters that he wrote preaching the crusade are really interesting because he formulated the concept of the Knights Templar in, in a very, um, uh, in a way that shaped the whole concept of the feudal knight, the soldier for Christ. And, and he actually verbalized that where it hadn't been conceptualized in a formal way before. So that was very important. And here is where he called it, Vézelay, right near Citeaux, where he was abbot, and uh, Cluny, the, the major reform centers of Europe. And of course, here is, here are the, temp here's the Templar seal, and a Knight Templar in, in his uh, habit and a Knight of St. John, who would be a Hospitaller. And here is one of the hospitals that I haven't shown you before, but the Hospital of St. John in Oxford, because Hospitallers were big in, in, in Oxford. And here is Queen Eleanor uh, leading her ladies on the crusade, and Conrad III of Germany, the Emperor Conrad III. And their antagonist was Manuel Comnenus of the Byzantine Empire, uh, seen across the Bosporus from Europe to Asia. Okay, who called the Third Crusade and why? Who were its leaders? Richard Lionheart, uh, Philip Augustus, Frederick Barbarossa. And as Travis said, he thinks it was a success. <laughs> that, that in many ways it was a success and Richard Lionheart really established it. And, and Maybe this crusade was as important as the first one in making crusading something that the Europeans could do. Here is Saladin, of course. The trigger for the Third Crusade was the Battle of Hattin and the fall of Jerusalem. Okay, and led by Saladin, Zengi had, had sort of paved the way for Saladin. Saladin then took over the leadership. And, and one of the interesting things we observed at this time about Muslim leadership was uh, they don't have a, a they don't have a way of choosing their leaders. Their leaders just sort of rise from talent from the bottom up, and but once the leaders get in power, they become very autocratic. Okay. <laughs> okay. And here are the conquests of uh, Saladin that uh, again scare everybody uh, and trigger the. Um, Third Crusade, so Saladin quickly has the state surrounded, and then we have some reconquest of the Byzantine states going on in the north as well, the reconquest of the Byzantines by another sultanate, and so the Crusader states are utterly surrounded, and so this, this strikes terror into the heart of the Crusader states, and uh, Richard Lionheart then appears on the horizon to save everybody. Frederick Barbarossa set out on that crusade, but he died on the way. This, this picture is his death in the river as he drowned. And here is the um, coinage of Richard Lionheart that shows his portrait. Let's move that down a little bit so you can see it. 
And here is the coinage of Philip Augustus, who then also went. But Philip Augustus was not a heroic type. He was organizing France at the time. So as far as he was concerned, he did his duty by putting in a cameo appearance. Yeah, all he did was show up, and that was his duty. But Richard Lionheart was really a sincere crusader. And he, in many ways, he was the epitome of all that was good about the Crusades. Yeah. And here are their roots as they went uh, along. Here's the root of Philip Augustus coming in here and the root of Richard stopping in Cyprus to conquer it first and then going on to Acre and then Richard Lionheart marched up and down the coast conquering everything here. And, and on the way home, sadly, he was conquered by Leopold of Austria, thrown into prison where he languished while they raised a king's ransom for him and, and he no no sooner had he gotten out of prison than he died in a, in a sort of accidental stabbing on the way home. <sighs> well, what was the Muslim response to the Crusades? As we saw, um, we mentioned Zengi and Saladin the Great arising arising really from out of nowhere. I mean, they didn't come from the great aristocracies. They were men of talent and ability who rose from the bottom to the top because of their generalship. And we saw Saladin reconquered most of the Holy Land. And what kind of a hero was he? Um, how would you characterize Saladin as a hero? Yeah, Travis. I'd characterize Saladin as power hungry. <laughs> power hungry. But, but the, the chronicles that we read do not say he was power hungry. They say he was humble. Yeah, the Arab chronicles. <laughs> But they give him the motive of saving Islam and serving Islam, and that's how they portray him. You don't agree with that? No, I, I think that they do portray him as, uh, as the Richard Lionheart of the Muslims. He's, okay. He's, he's true to the faith. He's uh, just, and, and probably he is very just. Everyone uh, described his sense of justice. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't uh, prevent him from being power hungry. <laughs> okay. Well, he appears, certainly the conquests we saw make him appear power hungry. I mean, he really unified the entire Muslim world, and that's what they needed to, to get rid of the Christians in their midst. And so he was, a, he was the kind of a hero that Islam needed at that time. Zengi was also a hero, but Saladin just overshadowed him again. But rising from nothing, he was a Kurd, and the Kurds were really on the fringes of society. They weren't. Um, they weren't one of the great uh, groups within the society, and, and, and he sort of rose from nothing. Whereas Richard Lionheart came from the highest aristocracy. He was a prince, and he was trained as a prince and a warrior. Saladin rose from the dust, you might say. And Islam succeeded because Saladin was so talented. Here we have the great man theory of history we have to look at. Was Saladin great because he drove the Christians out and conquered the whole empire? Or did the situation, the time, and the place call for a great leader? And if Saladin had not lived, would somebody else have filled his place? What do you all think? Joni? Probably a little of both. <laughs> he, he was a, a good military leader, and they did need someone at the time. I don't know if he hadn't lived. And the question is, would somebody else have arisen and filled that role that he filled, which was a leadership vacuum that he filled? On the other hand, there were no great rivals that we see in the sources. I mean, he w didn't have to kill, beat people off and kill them for um, rivaling his power. Uh, he, he seems to stand out as the only leader of the time. Uh, and so it's, it's an interesting question. Um, but he was a very talented man, man. So men of talent could rise in that society. And that's largely, it was his leadership. And interestingly, when he died, his empire broke up. So that attests to his, his talent uh, that he had. And here is he limited the Crusaders to this little strip of land. And this is after Richard Lionheart. I mean, that's, that's more than, than he had before Richard Lionheart uh, uh, came. Okay. And Damascus, or Damietta, now becomes 
the focus of the Christian attacks at this time because they want to go where the headquarters of the government is in Cairo, actually. Here's Cairo. And so Damietta becomes the target where they can reach Cairo and they want to eliminate the headquarters of the government. And here is um, the, the Nile River and this is Alexandria, of course, another of these important cities. Well, Innocent III and the Fourth Crusade, how did the Fourth Crusade go so wrong? <laughs> Were they just corrupt, or was it an accident, or what happened? I think that they set out with good intentions, a little bit deceptive, because they were planning on going to Egypt, and they weren't telling the, the rank and file. Um, but then I think that it, it's hard to say if it was just accidental, or if the Venetians hijacked the crusade. That's hard to tell. Yeah, well, if they hijacked it, they did it on the spur of the moment. What do you think, Jody? Maybe the Crusaders were just a little too optimistic in giving the numbers they thought were going to go, and so it could have just been an honest mistake. They just overestimated, and the Venetians, being commercial-oriented, merchant-oriented, they saw an opportunity for uh, a profit, and also then the diversion to Zara. And so I think it's probably some bit of an accident, but. Um, there had also been a lot of problems between Constantinople and the West for a long time, so some people probably didn't need a whole lot of persuasion. Yeah, there had been enmity ever since the First Crusade, when the First Crusaders thought they were deserted by the Byzantines. The Byzantines refused to come to their rescue at the Battle of Antioch, and that's when the animosity started building between the Byzantines. And the Byzantines hated the, uh, there's a lot of hatred of the Latins. Uh, there in the city too because they felt like you know the Latins had hijacked the crusading movement when the Byzantines had called for the crusade to come and rescue them and instead the Latins had taken over uh, and and so there was a lot of antagonism so I, I, I think that a lot of the crusaders were happy for Constantinople to fall not just because they could loot it although they were happy for that but because they saw it as a thorn in their side and as as a complicating factor. And so they built the Latin Empire. Well, what do you think was the impact on Europe and on the crusading movement of the, of the fall of, uh, of Constantinople? Here is Thebo, Count of Champagne, who was the leader, one of the leaders of it. I think that the fall of Constantinople um, really allowed Innocent to direct crusading movements throughout Europe uh, because it, he realized that it was acceptable <laughs> to, uh, the, the people were willing oh. to, to fight anywhere for the, the church and what they were offering and they didn't necessarily have to go to the Holy Land. Yeah, I think he was really fostering that idea. Well, what he was trying to build was a papal army. I mean, he wanted he wanted an army of faithful crusaders who would do whatever was beneficial to the papacy. And so he may have even welcomed it, I mean, in thinking that, um, sure, they shouldn't attack Christians, but, uh, but um, in the long run, they unified Christendom in a way by conquering the Byzantines. Well, here is the Doge of Venice, Henry Henri Dandolo, or I'm, I don't know whether he would have been called Henri or Henry. Um, what is the Italian equivalent of Henry? <laughs> I've heard him called Enrico. Enrico it would have been Enrico. Okay, I've taken this from a French book where they called him Henri. Uh, Enrico Dandolo, that's what he would have been as the Doge of Venice. And this is quite interesting. Um, here he is as the doge with Christ by his side. So he also um, is showing himself as a good Christian. And of course, I showed you the glories of Venice and how different it was from Europe and, and indeed uh, uh, Constantinople and all the other societies. I mean, Venice was going its own way and it was a different way as a, as a commercial empire. Uh, it, and in that way, it was, it was very akin to Islamic culture. In, in the commercial empire, but it was also very self-promoting. Uh, and this is Simon de Montfort, who we'll 
we'll see later, but he was a, a um, hero on the side of conservatism <laughs> and, and um, an advisor against the uh, crusade. Uh, Philip of Germany, who also uh, was one of the instigators of the um, attack on Constantinople, bringing his brother-in-law, um, uh, Alexis, uh, it wasn't Alexis Comnenus, I've forgotten the name of his brother-in-law now, it was Alexis II Comnenus, and Alexis III was on the throne, and Isaac was the father who was uh, blinded and put in prison. Okay, Alexis was the usurper of the throne, and, and and Alexis III was a usurper. Okay, and here is the route as they go and attack Zara and um, end up in Constantinople. And here are the ships arriving in Constantinople and the battles at sea that they go through. And here is the Byzantine Empire in 1203 and the Byzantine Empire and the Latin Empire after Constantinople falls. And of course, uh, one of the things, one of the societies that benefited the most from the fall of Constantinople was um, Italy, because so many refugees from the fallen empire poured into Italy with art treasures and religious treasures and relics, and also teachers and artists and, and uh, artisans and craftsmen in all of the arts of Byzantium. A lot of them poured into Italy, and um, uh, that had a huge impact on Europe. And here is Constantinople, of course, uh, the great city of Constantinople, and the greatest church, which is uh, um, Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom in Constantinople. And, of course, castles were built everywhere in the Byzantine Empire. Here's a castle uh, looking across the Bosporus. Well, Innocent III, at that point, turned to Europe, and here is all this, these new uses. Here are all these new uses of Crusades, the Northern Crusades, the conquest of the Baltic, and the, and the institutionalizing of the Teutonic Knights, and that was in the north, of course, and in the south we have the Albigensian Crusade with the Cathar heresy and the Romance culture of southern France, uh, led by the great hero of that battle, Simon de Montfort, and, and then the political Crusades in Italy. So here we have this German culture, this very northern culture that has been there in the empire. And they take off down the Rhine, and of course the Virgin is, is one of the major focuses. And here are the Crusaders setting off on the conquest of the north. And some more Crusaders conquering the north. And here are the, the states, um, the areas that they conquered, um, the Swedes up here, the Danes here, the, the Prussians here, um, and Samogitians, um, let's see, get all of these straight, the Pomeranians were here, and the Lithuanians were never conquered, interestingly, and uh, the purple is the Koronians, the Letts, the Estonians, the Laps, all of those people converted from paganism. And then we have the Mongol attacks uh, in, into that region. Um, and here we see the furthest extent of the Mongol Empire and the state created in the north that was actually a, a state of the Teutonic Knights. They created their own state, which was rather frightening, I think, for, <laughs> for Europe to have their own state. But the trade routes, again, that they developed, and this mirrors the trade routes that were developed by uh, the Templars in the Mediterranean. And so it's, it's quite amazing that these military um, orders eventually developed into commercial powers. How do you explain that? Why do you think they, they eventually turned into commercial empires? Well, they were located throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. People pledged money to them to aid their efforts against pagans, Muslims, whoever they were fighting against, and uh, they were just a very widespread network. I, I think that's the answer, that the lands that, that um, religious people gave them, uh, not um, faithful people, not, not necessarily uh, abbots and, and, and um, bishops and so on, but, but just ordinary people gave them so many donations and lands for their support that they ended up with a huge network of lands throughout Europe, and, and it was a kind of natural 
commercial network in, in the face of the growth of great commercial networks, that it was a natural for them to develop it in that way. Because one of the reasons why is because they were shipping um, uh, their supplies in kind. Uh, England was the only state that really had a cash economy. France, up until even as late as the 13th century, uh, in the rural areas, depended on barter. And so what these military uh, networks would do would be like they would have all of their all of their manors in France in the case of the Templars and when they needed supplies in Jerusalem instead of selling their goods here and sending money what they did was send their goods and then the the headquarters of the Templars in the Holy Land sold them and so you can see how a natural trading network would grow out of that and they became enormously wealthy uh, these entrepreneurs, they were entrepreneurs, just like the others. Uh, uh, Robert Lopez has a book called The Commercial Revolution of the Middle Ages, and um, this is the beginning of, uh, of um, what do you want to call it, uh, free enterprise trading, entrepreneurship. It's starting here. Uh, and of course, the Albigensian Crusade, we have a, a, a different culture in southern and northern France, and in fact, in the end, northern France conquered southern France and unified it into one country. Here is southern France with the main areas uh, of the crusade. This area here, this is Provence, which later comes over and takes charge, but this is the culture that was, that was conquered. Here's a scene of uh, Beaucaire, uh, one of the major battles uh, in the Albigensian Crusade. Philip Augustus was the king who kind of started it, and uh, Louis VIII, his son, finished the Albigensian Crusade, uh, and this was partly based on the defeat of uh, King John of England, and uh, driving him out of France, and once uh, Philip Augustus had solidified the north, then they could turn to the south. And here is Raymond VI, Count of Toulouse, who was the major defender of the south, and Simon de Montfort, our, our friend from the um, uh, Fourth Crusade, who then was the major hero in, um, in defeating the southern France. And at last, they um, uh, retreated to castles high on hilltops like this, but even those um, ended up being vulnerable to the attacks of the Crusaders. And Otto IV, the Emperor of Germany, got involved in this uh, as, as an enemy of the French in the Battle of Bouvines. He was eventually um, uh, put in his place by the French. And here is Raymond of Toulouse again. And Raymond VII of Toulouse, his son, who then ended up uh, actually intermarrying with the French crown and his children, then the children of him. And who did he marry? Do you remember? He married a, a princess, the daughter of the king or the sister of the king. And uh, they had no children, and the lands reverted to the crown. And, and so that's exactly how, how um, the French often got... Things. And here is the death of Simon de Montfort, who was uh, hit in the head with a stone. <laughs> okay. Louis VIII then takes over the leadership of the crusade, and when he dies, his wife Blanche of Castile then takes over the French kingdom and nurtures the future um, Saint Louis, who becomes Louis IX, and here is Saint Louis, Louis IX. He was actually sanctified by Philip the Fair. But he became the epitome of French kingship. Everything that the French had spent uh, their whole history of building in this kingship was all epitomized in St. Louis, who, who is the symbol of divine kingship ordained by God, free of any religious control by the papacy or anyone else, and including the bishops of France. He ruled by the grace of God. Well, here's a picture of the Albigensians being totally defeated and sort of ground into the dirt. Okay, the Fifth Crusade. Louis, I mean, Innocent III also called the Fifth Crusade, and he called a total of like seven crusades, if you include the Children's Crusade, which was sort of spontaneous. 
was he the height of the crusading movement? And was the reign of Innocent III a great turning point? Um, in many ways, it was. Why don't we think about these questions and maybe we'll address them when we come back and we'll finish our, our little survey here of the entire crusading movement. And I have some other questions at the end to, to uh, start you thinking about the meaning of the whole crusading movement. So let's take a break of maybe 10 or 15 minutes and then come back and continue our overview.